Hello, welcome to my channel, KC. That's me, Carrie Tug, the Sledge Storyteller. And I'm here to talk about the wonderful world of storytelling and to open up a discussion about how we can tell the best stories we possibly can. So, Thanksgiving in the U.S. is over, and I hope my fellow U.S. citizens had a great Thanksgiving. Mine was a case of a rare blessing from the pandemic because of the strong caution by state leadership. We, are, uh, we as a family, were limited uh, to celebrating in our own household which meant that I got to decide how everything was prepared. Thus, I smoked the turkey in my pellet grill, and the white meat turned out to be the moistest I've ever experienced. But Thanksgiving has passed, and as you can see, I'm ready to bring Christmas into the storytelling discussion, namely the best stories told in movies and specials, and where I see strength in how those stories were told. So here are 10, at least for me, uh, can't miss programs to watch. So, in number 10, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, 1972. So, here's my only Rankin Bass entry. Uh, as a whole, I do like those Christmas specials, but this is the only one that really makes the cut here. I admit I'm a sucker for origin and transformation stories, and while Santa Claus is Coming to Town does it in a paint-by-numbers fashion, the revelations of how Santa ended up with the elves, how he got the red suit, why he grows a white beard and how he ended up in the North Pole are all done in a fun fashion. They hit the nail on the head in casting Mickey Rooney as Santa Claus and even in his 50s at the time, uh, aptly working his young adult voice for uh, the young adult Santa Claus. They also struck gold in getting Fred Astaire as the postman narrator and Keenan Wynn as the winter warlock and the go-to voice for everyone else uh, who was featured as a character in that story, Paul Freese except for the female characters, obviously. Just a fun Santa Claus origin story. Moving on to number nine. Guilty pleasure here. Uh, the Night They Saved Christmas, a TV movie back in 1984. So during the first Christmas season, my wife and I had together, uh, she stopped by her parents' house to pick, a, uh, pick up a VHS recording off the TV of this movie that I had no memory of when it first aired and I, and I, she promised me that I'd love it. And you know, there is 80s cheese and Christmas cheese to it, but yes, I love it. It's all about an oil drilling project in the Arctic. The project manager, Michael Baldwin, who played by Paul Lamette of American Graffiti, he's approached by Santa's chief elf, played by Paul Williams, petitioning him to stop dynamiting for oil because it uh, put North Pole City in danger. Michael laughs him off, but his wife Claudia, played by Jacqueline Smith of the Charlie's Angels TV series, is ultimately coaxed into uh, bringing the kids uh, traveling to the North Pole City to meet Santa, played wonderfully by Art Carney, and she's informed of a solution that would satisfy the oil, satisfy the oil company and keep North Pole City safe. And it has a TV movie budget, so the project design and effects aren't the strongest, but along with the performances I like, there, there's a lot of fun with the science fiction approach to explaining how Santa accomplishes the impossible task that always comes up in Santa discussions. And as I mentioned before, I, I love Art Carney's Santa performance. He's a bit rough around the edges, wisecracking, but you totally sense his dedication and love for the children of the world. At the very least, it's uh, Carney's Christmas show comeback after his performance in the Star Wars Holiday Special. But move on. Number eight. Polar Express 2004. So the mocap animation has its flaws, but the kids in their, uh, and their depiction of being kids is played out well, and uh, there's a lot of fun in watching such absurd chaos as the little girl's uh, ticket flying out the wind, uh, flies out the window, and it's picked up by so many animals before it makes its way back to the train. And the look of the city in the North Pole is beautifully designed, and Tom Hanks' voice brings a lot of sweetness to the character of Santa Claus, as well as everyone else, like the conductor and the boy grown up. Now, I, I never read the book until after I saw the movie and realized that there were some heavy embellishments in the movie, but overall, uh, uh, there's lots of heart and lots of fun. Moving on to number seven A Christmas Story from 1983. Uh, who doesn't love Ralphie? And I think we can all relate to him, at least in, uh, at least for each of us, there's an experience we see him have that we can relate to. We might empathize over his fixation on just one thing he wants for Christmas. Uh, when we wait on that moment when he finally stands up to the, uh, and overcomes the bully Scott Farkas, 
And I think we all have that experience of turning in a school assignment thinking we aced it only to get it back with a low score and maybe even some disapproval over the, our big ideas. And uh, it's a wonderful story you know, and a wonderful opportunity to kind of character-wise of how to make a character relatable. And Ra uh, Ralphie's encounter with Santa, it's iconic. The, the Lady Leg Lamp has become iconic and uh, Gene Shepard's narration sweetens everything about it. Number six, Elf, 2003. Now, this would easily have ranked higher if not for scenes of disgusting food concoctions like spaghetti and syrup that forced me to have to, have to cringe for a little bit. But enough of that negative. For one thing, I love to see the creative, any creative approach to the Santa Mythos as I kind of talked about with the Night at They Say Christmas, you know, like the clausometer here. And of course, Buddy's coming to New York, New York having a worldview based entirely on what he experienced from living in the North Pole with Santa and his elves. It, it makes for a, a great fish out of water story. While the way they portray the budding relationship between Buddy and Jovi is very far-fetched, the, the sheer charm of Buddy's innocence is irresistible. And as well, how he uh, puts all the Christmas craft he learned uh, in the North Pole uh, you know, to spread Christmas cheer. It's a lot of fun. But James Conn's portrayal of his dad works beautifully. The, the chemistry between him and Will Ferrell, it, it's done wonderfully. It's a, and Ed Asner, he's an awesome Santa, and the portrayal of the community coming together was sheer brilliance. But moving on. Uh, number five, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, 1966. Now, I've seen a lot of love given to the live-action Jim Carrey movie, it, it's not for me, but the half-hour special, it thrives on its simplicity. The, the Dr. Seuss storybook was popular on its own, but the addition of the two songs, Bajo Flores and Mr. Grinch, add to its iconic standing. The focus of the plot is the, the Grinch is driven to steal Christmas from the Who's, and you get the full feel of his seething hatred for Christmas in the end process. Then in the end, the Grinch has every Christmas item from Whoville all bagged up, and he's looking down from Mount Crumpet, looking down on Whoville, licking his chops over the prospect of seeing who's going to cry boo-hoo. And as a kid watching this, you were thinking about how much you'd be crying your eyes out waking up uh, to an empty living room on Christmas morning. But the, the Who's of Whoville hey, all come to Town Square, and they, they still sing Pajo Flores, as if nothing bad had happened at all. And for all the fun the, the Who's would have with the Garginkers, from Troopers and Tatinkas that Santa gave them, Christmas was something that they held in their hearts, and that uh, would come no matter what the Grinch took. He realizes this and finds Christmas in his own heart, and he brings everything back to find his place among them. This is a story that invites introspection, and, and for this season it invites us to embrace the spiritual aspect of the holiday more than just the uh, material aspect. In a previous video, I mentioned Dr. Seuss's story, The Sneetches, and how powerful the mess that message was. And here's another powerful message from Dr. Seuss. Number four, A Charlie Brown Christmas, 1965. Now, it's, an amaz it's amazing to learn about the challenges that uh, Charles Schultz and the animation studio had in making this special and uh, based uh, in getting it out, and that there was little faith that it would successfully connect with its intended audience. It starts out inviting so much sympathy for Charlie Brown as he's met with so much ridicule and the bold decision to buy a small three branch evergreen as the uh, Christmas tree for the play he was directing. Uh, the initial harsh treatment from the rest of the Penis Gang uh, followed by ultimately seeing what was in Charlie Brown's heart that, uh, that the tr uh, tree was given its due love and made beautiful by the whole bunch of them. So, this special taps into the spectacle, spectacle we all love about Christmas, yet doesn't shy away from also tapping into the spiritual side of Christmas by quoting from the Gospel of Luke. It's truly wonderful to see religious and non-religious people expressing their love for a Charlie Brown Christmas. It truly amazes me. But move on to number three, Miracle on 34th Street, 1947. So, it helps that I just watched this movie off of my own tradition of watching it on Thanksgiving night. Since the movie begins on Thanksgiving Day, that makes it feel appropriate. But uh, key to its success is Edmund Gwynn's uh, convincing performance that uh, he, he gives as Santa Claus. And the fact that he won Best Supporting Actor Oscar should tell you that he delivered on that. 
He never condescends to anyone he talks to, most notably Susan, young Susan Walker, and even as she expresses her disbelief in Santa, but respects her, gives her a chance to get to know him for what he's all about, all while he shows his affection. Every character matters, even minor characters grab your attention, and it's cleverly written right down to the end resolution. And I know how to make anyone who, had, uh, who has seen it want to rewatch it. Uh, you know, the postal worker who suggests that all the letters uh, to Santa get sent to the courthouse uh, so uh, this Santa can get it all. That's Jack Albertson, you know, who you may know as Grandpa Joe on Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory with Gene Wilder. But, you know, there have been several remakes that have appropriately been labeled as inferior to the original, most notably the one with uh, Richard Attenborough. Uh, but I admit that I have a soft spot for the 1973 version with Sebastian Cabot as Santa. You might know you might know him as uh, Giles French on Family Affair, that TV series of the uh, 60s, maybe 70s. But it's a good look at uh, good look at him makes it easy to believe that he needed an opportunity to play Santa. So it's I think it's worth a look. It it's a de at least a decent remake. Number two. A Christmas Carol. So I cheated with three different uh, versions that uh, that I always have a soft spot that I make a tradition to always watch. And it shouldn't surprise since it's been adapted literally hundreds of times. And it's a, a very powerful story about a cold-hearted miser who only needed a reminder of the events of his past that led to his bitterness, the stark realities of his present, and the dark future uh, ahead of him with its harsh consequences. And there are several versions I tried to make time for, including the 1910 Thomas Edison Studios silent version, the 1935 Seymour Hicks version, and a guilty pleasure half hour one that came out in 1949, kind of a TV movie. It was narrated by Vincent Price. It's got like Z-list actors and a rush pacing. Um, but you know, I have, here are my three must-sees. So first, it's a 1982 cartoon version I discovered as a kid. While it suffers from mediocre animation, heavy use of uh, stock uh, footage sequences, there is a lot of heart in the character designs, the pacing, and the voice performances. Albeit, you look at its IMDb M tree and you'll see just nine voiceover actors because they were all given multiple roles and the key characters, they're all convincing. They, they, they show heart. Then there's what's the general consensus favorite version. Uh, it's just not my number one version. Uh, Alastair Sim as Scrooge in 1951. No doubt he owns the movie with his uh, convincing indifference to, uh, to uh, the different people he has to uh, deal with. And you know his quirkiness you know, is beautifully done uh, in both Bad Scrooge and Good Scrooge. And the, the scenes in past, present, and yet to come are played out well with uh, great performances uh, from the actors playing the spirits. I thoroughly love this version, but my absolute favorite is George C. Scott's version, and that's 1984. So here that quirkiness is missing, but uh, Scott is equally indifferent, uh, effectively stone cold as the bad Scrooge, as well as warm and charismatic as the reformed Scrooge. And what puts this uh, above Alice, uh, Aster Sim, at least the production, for me, is the even stronger scenes with the ghost from Frank Finlay's intimidating J Jacob Marley to Michael Carter's outright creepy ghost of Christmas yet to come. And a bit of gee whiz trivia for you on that. Uh, Michael Carter, uh, the year prior, he played Jabba's butler, Bib Fortuna, in Return of the Jedi. But Angela Pleasance was a great ghost of Christmas past, but what completely seals the deal is Edward Woodward as the ghost of Christmas present. He turns his dialogue into a commanding diatribe that rattles you just as much as it does Scrooge. So, so much so that, you know, I, I love this guy's acting, so I, I um, tapped into the 1980s series that he was in, The Equalizer, which was later adapted into the Denzel Washington movies by that name. But it's got heart, it, uh, it, it's well played out, and everything uh, is set up, all the setting is designed perfectly. So, you get it all. I love uh, the little boy, Tiny Tim. Uh, they made him look very sickly, but he showed lots of heart. And uh, Bob Cratchit, played by uh, David Warner, he, he's well known for playing villains. I, as I understand, he wanted to get away from that for a little bit, uh, play something, play actually somebody good. 
and he was quite convincing as that. But that's my favorite. So my number one, It's a Wonderful Life, 1946. So, okay, so my number one, we, we've seen that be number one for a lot, of, a lot of people, and I'm gonna follow that trend based on what's in this, what, what beats in the heart. Now, all of them cite the power in what we see uh, of the performance of Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey as he sees the alternate world where he doesn't exist. And that part of it doesn't mean much without first establishing how good a man George is. And it's powerful writing combined with, uh, with Jimmy Stewart's powerful acting, both as the kind-hearted George and the, the George who's hit rock bottom. We believe in how great a wife Donna Reed's Mary Bailey is and how tight-fisted and heartless Lionel Barrymore's Mr. Potter is. You know, I can't effectively list the strengths coming from all the other characters, but George's brother Harry, the angel Clarence, Mr. Gower, Bert and Ernie, they're all well-written and well-acted characters who engage us throughout the story. Uh, no wonder it's been adapted so many times in TV series episodes during the holiday season. So, those are my must-see Christmas programs. Agree, disagree, something important that I left out. A favorite of yours that I left out, feel free uh, to mention it and tell me why it's there. But uh, I've listed in the description other popular Christmas movies or specials I've seen that didn't connect with me that uh, so much as, you know, I probably like them. They just didn't make the cut. And they'll be, uh, you see those, you'll, you'll be no wonder if I didn't consider them. But still, please comment below. If you like this video, please click like. If you like this channel, please click subscribe or follow me on Instagram. Thanks for watching. Uh, the links, as always, the link to order sledge number one is below the description, or you can order it on Kindle. Let's all look for civility amid all the, the bad news out there about the pandemic and follow the precautions given to us. Let's make the most of this holiday season. Everybody be safe and God bless.